on today's show. Australia is rich in minerals and Tesla would like to take advantage of that and a little bit of an update on the Victorian EV tax. G'day, my name is Chris and I cover from an Australian perspective everything around about electric vehicles, renewables, solar, wind and well more. If you're new to the channel, welcome, thanks for clicking on the link and if you want to subscribe, please, it does help. Otherwise, think about joining us over here on Patreon where you get early access to news, polls, behind the scenes and a lot more that you just don't get here. And I'd like to thank my producers and there's Tessa on the Gong, Ashley Hill, Nigel Faria and Alan Burnt. Now, in a sec, I'm about to launch into a big news show. And you may have noticed last week, if you're a regular viewer, I put out several little shows. And, well, I'm doing this little bit of a trial in that bringing you fresh as it happens content. And uh, so I'm hoping you're enjoying that. So if you missed any of those episodes, some of that is going to be in today's episode. And I'll try to delineate it by um, putting down in the, um, the chapter markers beneath that it was actually aired last week. But that said, my patrons, they actually got to see about, well, three, four, five, six, maybe six stories you guys haven't seen. So yeah, hang around, do check it out. And without further ado, let's get into this. An Australian company, Janus Energy, located in Berkeley Vale, New South Wales, has refueling times for electric trucks sort of with a forklift yep that's a 600 kilowatt hour battery being delicately removed from a converted t403 kentworth truck this battery swap system means that truck drivers can pull in swap out to a new battery and keep going in just five minutes which is way faster than even the fastest high rate diesel pump can manage Janus Energy is doing truck conversions and fitting them with 300 kilowatt motors, roughly what an existing truck engine was capable of. But because it's electric and can be electrically tuned with 100% instant power, their motors deliver 3,500 newton meters of torque compared to the 2,265 newton of a diesel variant. This increase in torque means that the converted trucks can haul 50 more metric tons of cargo compared to a conventional engine, up from 70 to now 120 tons. With a range of 500 to 600 kilometers, this system and charging stations are being installed along major freeway routes, so truck drivers can do this swap quickly and be on their way. As if that wasn't impressive enough, the big headline here is that Janus Energy claims that by going electric, significant fuel savings can be achieved. How much? Half. Yep, half. Total cost savings of up to $75,000 per year per truck. I'll say that again. Cost savings of $75,000 per year per truck. At the moment, Janus is looking for investors and people interested in running the charging stations. And uh, so look, I've left a link down below if you wanna go check them out. Daniel Bleakley, an engineer and climate activist, posted on Twitter and created a YouTube channel showing coal miners and their first experience of what driving an EV can be like. A warning, by the way, explicit language ahead. So if you're easily offended, maybe turn off the sound now, as like their facial expressions tell the story here. So have you ever been in one? No. This is first time. First time. No, first I'm time, last night shift. I'm driving it. <laughs> Planned it. How is again? Holy! Holy! How is again? Oh! Holy! Oh! Holy! Oh, oh, oh. Give it a bit. Holy oh, shit! <laughs> Cancel the rant. Fuck it! Put your knees in it. Give it some. Whoa! Fuck. Go! 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 <laughs> Holy! Give it. Wow. Fuck. But the slogan. Fuck. Oh, that <laughs> makes me sick as that. Holy fucking hell. Jeez, that's got some going on. <laughs> wow. This is ridiculous. Fuck it out. It's like a roller coaster. Yeah. You feel it, you feel it in your face even. Yeah. Mate, you just can't hear it again. What do you think of that? Yee <laughs> <laughs> 
That is some serious acceleration, isn't it? Oh, she brakes by itself. Yeah, so the regen's on, so... That's charging. That's recharging, yeah. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome, man. Trust it, it'll, it'll turn for you. Wow! <laughs> so, wait, so... <laughs> <laughs> so just, just stop. That is fucking nuts! So does that convert you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you, <laughs> With a surprise announcement over the weekend of the Victorian government announcing a $3,000 EV subsidy, David Kayo on Twitter has confirmed that Tesla has adjusted prices for buyers who had already paid for their car. Thanks to David for sharing this information, he says that Tesla honoured the $3,000 rebate for an order that was already paid in full over the weekend. Pick up due next week. This is most likely great news for those who have actually been eagerly awaiting the Model 3s and shows good form by Tesla in notifying owners about how they actually operate and keeping them informed. So, nice one Tesla. Mazda has opened orders for its first electric vehicle, the MX-30 electric. Starting at $65,409, this mid-size SUV packed with Mazda's attempt at going higher end throws in a 12-speaker Bose sound system, 18-inch wheels, heads-up display, 360-degree camera, and a lot more. But with a 35.5 kilowatt hour battery, reported at just 30 kilowatt hours usable, this SUV has a range of only 200 kilometers. The front-wheel drive EV has a 107 kilowatt motor capable of producing 271 newton meters of torque. But obviously being a larger car, its zero to 100 time is rather poor at 9.7 seconds. Whilst its looks, badge and size might appeal to some drivers, that range of performance isn't going to win over a lot of buyers in Australia. Even if I discount it to $62,000 with thanks to the Victorian government EV subsidy, it's still very much a stretch when you think that, well, a Tesla Model 3 is $65,000 or the MG ZS EV is now just a bit over $41,000 and can go further than this car. I'd be curious nonetheless to see how it actually goes and orders can be done now with deliveries expected in August. So let's hope that we actually get more EVs on our roads soon. Check out the world's largest tidal energy generator. A 2 megawatt floating tidal energy converter, the Orbital O2 2 megawatt has just been launched off the coast of Scotland. Pretty impressive, huh? And it makes me wonder, how much can we do with our oceans surrounding Australia? After all, most of our population is centred around coastlines, so transmission to places where it's consumed is small, meaning that transmission loss, that is like energy decreasing over distance, is minimal. Be great to see how this actually fares in real world trials and they have linked this up with like a, a green hydrogen system and yeah, I'm not going to about to get into that today, no. A study by a German team has found that as EVs increase in number, they could lead to lower household electricity prices. How? If EVs move their charging periods to night time, thus helping to avoid peak power demand during the day and flatten the demand curve, this would lead to a reduced grid expansion and thus lower grid fees, which make up a large part of power bills. In addition, as we see more EVs have either vehicle to home or vehicle to grid capabilities, that is to say your EV battery is used to power your home or the grid, then AMO, that's the Australian energy market operator, could store excess energy from the grid and make it usable when demand increases. Gas plants need not apply. The net effect? In the near future, EVs will help keep electricity prices low by soaking up excess renewable power during high generation periods. And when high demand occurs, these EVs will join the national energy market to share their energy. Again, all to keep costs low. And if this ever becomes a thing, link is below by the way, then the NEM could turn on and off EV chargers to, well, help stabilize the grid and provide battery backup. And imagine thousands of batteries, tens of thousands of batteries, hundreds of thousands of batteries, um, providing electricity to the entire state, in fact, the entire nation. 
This is an actual thing that could be occurring very, very soon, folks. So the next time you see or hear an anti-EV person say, how will the grid cope or how will they make electricity prices go up? Just point them over here. What does Australia have plenty of? Minerals. In particular, more than half the world's supply of lithium. So instead of fracking this stuff or digging up this stuff, Mark Tweedle, Director of Energy at Tesla Australia, says we should be focusing on our efforts on producing batteries. Yep, batteries. In an article featured in The Australian last week, Simon Evans writes how Australia is in a prime position to make big gains from being a large supplier of lithium to a global industry projected to be worth $400 billion by 2030. Listen to these figures. Worldwide in 2020, EVs made up to 4% of all car sales. Last year during a pandemic, about 100,000 EV sales occurred up to April 2020, but it surged to almost 600,000 by December 2020. Stockbroking house UBS predicts electric vehicles will be around 20% of global vehicle sales by 2025. And what do these EVs need? Lithium. Fun fact, Tesla uses predominantly Australian lithium in its batteries. Ironic, given that it's dark up here, it gets shipped over here, here, and maybe even here, and then ultimately comes back to us looking like this. Elon, Australian giga plant, please? I know you love this country. Why not just, yeah, set one up down here? That'd be really appreciated. Last week, no surprises, the Victorian Lower House of Parliament passed the electric vehicle tax in Victoria. This doesn't mean it's actually legislated yet or nor law. It's sitting with the upper house and it had a first, second reading, uh, rather the second reading was deferred, some sort of you know technical term that they use for that, uh, which means we have some time left folks to petition these crossbench members of parliament. I've left the phone numbers, names, and uh, email addresses down beneath. So if you could do everyone a favor, the world a favor, get onto them, give them a call, email them, write to them, do whatever you can to actually let them know that this tax being proposed by the Victorian government is not the right time. It's completely against everything they're actually pushing for and in no way, shape or form will incentivize people into cars. And whilst we're talking about incentives and subsidies and so forth, because I had a few comments last week on social media and also in the comments about people saying, I believe that electric vehicle owners should be paying for roads and that sort of stuff. To which, well, I wrote this. In a fair and just world, absolutely, there shouldn't be subsidies, Robert. But when fossil fuel subsidies exist in Australia to the tune of $50,000 per minute or $27 billion per year, every taxpayer is paying for petrol and diesel cars. For those driving an EV and filling up at home with solar power and renewable energy, they're paying for people to drive petrol and or diesel cars. I hope that makes sense, Robert. It's about equity. That's all. So the argument that people try to use that fuel excise for, uh, pays for roads is, well, it needs to just be shot down. Fuel excise is just another tax and we all pay taxes. So what I'm paying, what you're paying, we are all paying for our fair share of roads, okay? More importantly, because there is actually fossil fuel subsidies to the tune of $27 billion per year, per minute, that equates to $50,000. So I'm subsidizing people driving petrol cars. Uh, I'm subsidizing um, coal power plants. I'm subsidizing gas power plants. Do I like that? No. Do I talk about it and protest about it and try to raise knowledge and awareness around it? Yes, I do. So uh, if, if ever someone says to you, no, nah, but EVs should be paying for the fuel excise, just point out that, well, hey, you too pay taxes, you pay GST. Um, there's, there's many taxes we pay in Australia. And uh, in this state that we are living in, Victoria, to go at this alone is just, yeah, just crazy. So please get onto these crossbench mem members and let's stop this tax from even getting up. Okay, time for a round of bites. This Wednesday and Thursday, the Smart Energy Conference will be held in the ICC Sydney. 
with a massive program covering all things energy from hydro, solar, wind, hydrogen and more, this event is free to attend and has some big names providing keynote speeches. I've left a link down below so please do check it out. Polestar 2 has launched a smartphone digital key technology that will enable owners of Polestar 2 EVs to unlock, lock, turn it on and off and control the car's climate. The system, much like Tesla's, uses a secure digital key and 18 Bluetooth sensors in and around the Polestar 2. And it obviously will then communicate with any paired device to support entry and exit of the car. Polestar has also included in the most recent over-the-air update new battery preheating measures to improve range, a revision to the way distance to empty is shown with a more linear algorithm and an adaptation to the wider uh, phone charger to take advantage of Apple's new MagSafe technology. ChargeFox has completed the first phase of the ultra rapid charger network with its latest addition in Cooma, New South Wales. Located about 100 kilometers south of Canberra, this four stall eight plug site has two 350 kilowatt chargers and two 50 kilowatt DC fast chargers. As you can see from this map, ChargeFox has added 22 sites stretching from far north Queensland along the eastern board all the way over to Western Australia. Blow me down, Nigel. There's two ultra rapid chargers over there. Two! Have you heard of the Citizens Own Renewable Energy Network Australia? Maybe you've heard of Corina? Nope. Well, up until last year, I hadn't heard of them either. And well, one of my producers, Ashley, he put me onto them as this organisation does amazing things. Corina operates Australia's longest running donor driven revolving fund, the Aid in Renewable Energy Projects. The fund offers interest-free loans to non-profit organisations to help um, get them up with carbon-reducing emission programs. And this is our latest project. The City of Geelong Bowls Club, which now has 89 kilowatts of solar panel system on their roof. At $92,000, this 189 panel system is expected to provide electricity savings of around $15,000 per year, meaning the system will be paid back in about six years. To date, Karina has provided more than $800,000 in interest-free loans and the Geelong Bowls Club is its 41st project. If you'd like to get involved and donate to Karina, please see the link below and let's help decarbonize our world. Polestar has released in all European markets its own video streaming app for the Polestar 2. This new functionality brings web-based streaming content from various providers directly to the 11-inch centre display. To be used whilst either parked or charging, content includes news services and national TV broadcasts where available. This feature is once again, I think, thanks to Tesla, who made cars fun again. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of an episode. I do hope you've enjoyed it and, well, this new format. If it um, has been good and, well, bad or indifferent, do let me know. I want to know. I'm going to be experimenting with this for the next several weeks. And my Patreons, they've been getting, um, like, well, they've had about four of these in the last week. So if you want to get uh, more news more often and behind the scenes, do consider joining me over there on Patreon, where from as little as $2.50 per month, that's 60 cents per week, you get this and well, a whole, whole lot more. As per usual, if you haven't already, subscribe, it's free. Uh, leave me a comment, as I've already asked you to. <laughs> and otherwise, you'll be good and you'll be green. <laughs>